Hello, Amy. Welcome back to the new mid. We had so much fun last week that I had to have you back. <laughs> oh, hello. I'm so glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, w there are so many topics to talk about with nutrition <laughs> and we just, you know, we're, I'm sure we're going to run out of time again today. But that being said, I was wondering if we can talk about counting calories versus carbohydrates. Could you help us with that? Sure. So, um, you know, that's an interesting phenomenon that has kind of occurred in my t above 20 years of being a dietitian. Um, carbohydrates have become very bad and people are afraid of them. Um, and I think it's mostly because of lack of um, appropriate education or understanding of food. Uh, so, you know, there definitely is a benefit to count carbohydrates if you have diabetes. For sure, you want to be aware of what you're eating. And counting total calories is really important to see kind of what your total intake is versus where you need to be. Um, so both could be important um, depending on the individual. I think the biggest caveat to this is that I hear a lot of people who come to me who are counting calories, but they have no idea what their calorie goal should be. So my response to that, which is obviously not a popular response is why are you counting the calories if you don't know where you need to be? So I would say as long as people can really accept that that's the first step, you know, towards hitting your goal and knowing, hey, I'm going to have to do lots of hard work and uh, additional steps to get to my goal, that's important. And really, I, I really feel like um, as a whole, our society needs to kind of back off on the obsession with carbohydrates. Um, it is our preferred source of energy. There is a right way um, to eat your carbohydrates. And so, um, again, I kind of challenge people with, okay, if you're counting your carbohydrates, what is your goal? Why are you counting them? You know, if it's to get into ketosis, maybe that's not the right thing. So um, from an, it's really kind of individualized. So I know it's not the best information. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is I've also heard it depends on when, where you eat your carbohydrates. So it's better to eat them in the beginning of the day rather than at night before you go to bed. Is that so? I think information? That, I think that might be maybe like an Oprah thing, <laughs> so, you know, or you know. Yeah. But or, I mean, just because you're burning more calories, you know, during the day, so you're burning off more of the carbohydrates. So I think the important thing for everybody to to remember and really have kind of radical acceptance um, is to really accept the fact that our brain's primary fuel source is carbohydrates. So at no point in time should we be restricting our brain from readily available fuel. Um, now, if we're somebody who eats um, over the required, of, required amount of carbohydrates, absolutely, we need to take a look at timing and portions, um, you know, but just like any macronutrient, if you overeat on carbohydrates more than your goal, it's going to be stored as fat. If you overeat in your, your protein, it's going to be stored as fat. If you overeat in your fat, it's going to be stored as fat. So I, I really try to kind of stay away from demonizing carbohydrates. And a lot of that information isn't necessarily true. Our brains are very sophisticated and complicated, but they don't really have a trigger to say, okay, it's 401, change the way you digest this particular macronutrient. That's what I always tell my clients. So it's basically knowing how many carbohydrates you as a person should have a day. Yes. And yes. just sticking to that and like Absolutely. How many proteins and how many calories you should have. And then you stick to that. Yep. You've got it. Okay. That makes sense. Now, how about sugar? Now, can you talk to me about sugar? Cause it just seems, you know, I'm a kid of, remember we went through everything. Well, I did when I was younger about fat, fat. Yes, fat, yes, yes. You know, yes. so it was like fat free this, fat free that. Yes. But then sugar took off. Yes. So that's so funny that you say that. I do remember that. I went to Virginia <laughs> Tech and, you know, while I was in school, the big fat free phase was on. And in our food science class, we were a testing site for Olestra. So there's very few oh. folks that, um, you know, are my age group that remember that, that, that Olestra, you know, you just did not, oh, yeah. not digest the fat. Um, and I always say like, when you take the fat out of a product from a food science, which is like from the, from the chemistry standpoint, you have to put something into it, um, to make that product, um, appear and solidify as it used to. So lots of time when they were taking the fat out of something, they had to add something. Um, and lots of times it was sugar, right? And so we went from this, you know, fat free phenomenon 
where a lot of the products were um, had a little bit more sugar or sodium or additives just to make it taste right. decent, right? And then all of a sudden, people started to get really, really nervous about sugar. And, you know, sugar is the devil. That's what's causing all the weight gain. You know, sugar is... Um, it can be confusing. This is from my perspective because a lot of people look at the nutrition labs and they say, oh my gosh, this has so much sugar. But we have to keep in mind that your carbohydrates, you know, they digest and into the simple form of glucose, which is sugar, right? And so there's different types of sugar. You've got your natural sugar and then you've got your added sugar. And I'm super happy that on the nutrition labels, they've changed that. So now when you look at a nutrition label, you can see what the added sugar is and then you can also go to the ingredient list and kind of compare that and, and make, you know, a pretty uh, um, decent choice on if you want to eat that product or not. I would say, you know, if you're somebody who adds a lot of sugar, and this is back to the day I'm thinking of my grandparents, you know, when they had their tea and they put the tablespoon of the sugar um, in the tea. And again, I'm not judging or knocking that. But if you're somebody who makes a lot of baked goods, and you add sugar to your cereal and your tea, or you have a lot of um, those prepackaged items that are high in sugar, yes. I mean, that is definitely something um, that we would wanna look at and maybe start to integrate some changes. Um, but if you're somebody who kind of eat, who, who eats sugar or puts in my fitness pal, this drives me bonkers, their food and they get that highlight that says, you've had too much sugar for the day and it's all fruit, or you know whole foods okay that's a completely different story so i feel like we can't kind of put everything in this sugar category unless we really really dig down and say okay what is the source of that sugar i i understand that but it just feels like there's a lot of sugar in our foods and it feels like we eat sugar that we don't realize we're eating and sugar is addictive you know i start to think about chocolate you know or mm -hmm. not good sugars, you know, mm -hmm. the not fruit, but actually during the summer, you eat a lot more fruit, right? But it just feels like sugar is everywhere. Uh, and I, I would say, you know, in the United States, we definitely package and make our food differently than, you know, than Europe does. Um, I was lucky enough to have a position uh, where in product development, where we did make a lot of our formulas um, in Europe there. It was very, very different there. Um, you know, it's all marketing from my perspective, right? Like these, these big food companies, they want to sell their product. They want to have the highest profit margin that they can. They don't care about diabetes. They don't care about heart disease. This is just my perception. You know, they're not natural food just because of the, the, the palate with the United States is not going to sell like that packaged food. Right. So so I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Do we blame the you know the big food companies for that, or do we blame the American public? Which sounds like horrible for me to say, right? But, but you know, can we empower ourselves to have better knowledge and make better decisions and not purchase those foods? Probably. Will we? Probably not. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Speaking of Americans in Europe, our portion sizes are a little bit bigger. Yes. You know, we, we seem to eat more food. Yes. So what is a good portion size? So, I mean, again, that's very individualized, but from my perspective, there's not really a need to have more than three to four ounces of a lean protein at any meal. Our bodies don't really efficiently digest more than that. Um, and I think from a fruit and vegetable standpoint, we would love for those portions to be bigger, you know, one to two cups at each meal, you know, and your grains again, which are like, like your carbo which are your carbohydrates, which are demonized, I feel like they get a bad rap because they're more caloric, right? Uh, so a serving size of rice is like a third of a cup to a half of a cup. Well, uh, most people, if they ordered from an Asian restaurant in the United States, would be really disappointed if they got that portion size with their food, uh, right? So but I would prefer for that grain to be a half of a cup to, to a cup. And again, it's, it's very individualized. Um, but I would say the portions that I'm telling you are very different than what we see in a restaurant, unless it's fine dining. And I always say, think about fine dining, right? They're, that particular owner of that restaurant, right, from a business perspective, is spending a lot more money on that better food, right? So they have to decrease the portion size 
to get that profit. And I know, you know, so, so the, the more fancier the restaurant, um, the more likely the portions are a little bit closer to my recommendation for my experience. I, I love that. That's that I can relate to that. I can understand that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, every movie that, that shows that like little tiny. Yes, know. yes, yes. You know, at the, at the French restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I had a personal trainer once tell me that I could have pasta, but it uh -huh. could only be a cup. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was like, that's tiny. <laughs> that's not, that's not very much. That's not a portion. <laughs> yes, I'm Italian, um, uh, you know, and I have some other um, um, uh, in me as well. But if somebody gave me a cup of pasta, I would be, it would be a shock to my uh, system. So you're <laughs> yeah. right. I mean, we all have a certain amount of carbohydrates that we should eat in a day. And then we just kind of make the decision on what's going to work at the particular meal. Um, right. Yeah. That makes sense. Now you talked a little bit about grains. Yep. So what is good fiber, especially for our bowels? So, you know, we want to look at more um, a combination from my perspective in your um, complex carbohydrates, which would be um, uh, more of your brown fibrous breads, um, your... I don't really talk about like brown rice and brown pasta because from my perspective, the difference really from the fiber isn't that much, but kind of combining that with your good plant, um, fruit and vegetables, uh, fiber are, are really important. So, um, again, I have a lot of clients who come into my office and feel, um, very proud of themselves that they've added brown rice to their regimen. But really when they're telling me, about their palate, they don't really love it. Um, they would probably have a better benefit just by increasing their fruits and vegetables, and their and you know, and I would be completely fine with that. That's that's great. So again, that portion size, have yes. two to three cups of fruits and vegetables, would be would be sufficient. Yes, yes. Now, how about hydration? How much water should we drink? You know, I have friends that are I have to have a gallon a day, yeah. and they have their special gallon container, and they're you know, really proud. Yeah. How about that? How much water should, should we, should we have? So I'm a big geek about hydration. I'm glad that you brought it up. It's, it's also something that we work into our nutrition kind of profiles here that sleep, food, and water. Um, it's super important. Um, I would say for, you know, there is a way that we can calculate it from a dietitian perspective based off of somebody's height and weight and activity. Um, but I would say the basic goal is to have about 64 ounces a day of water. Um, and something that I talk to my uh, clients about, which is going to sound a little bit weird, is your water takes up the same room as food in your stomach. So um, it's important to get both. We want you to have your vitamins and minerals and, you know, and your carbohydrates and your fat and your protein. We also want you to get your hydration. So you don't necessarily have to drink three cups of water before you eat your meal to try to like trick yourself into feeling satiated, right? But if you don't drink enough water, you risk um, really kind of confusing your mind, right? Our bodies are not so great at telling us when we're dehydrated. Um, we start to feel dehydrated when we lose about 1% of our total water. Our bodies don't tell us that we're dehydrated until we've lost two to 3%, right? So oftentimes you can be dehydrated or chronically dehydrated and you're getting mixed signals and thinking, oh my gosh, I'm hungry, right? Because your brain is trying to tell you, I need water, I need water. And so I do have a lot of clients who will come in and say, I'm constantly hungry, I'm constantly hungry, or I crave salt. And I just like people to be a little bit mindful of that. The first thing that I do when somebody tells me that is we really assess how much water are you drinking in a day? So I would say for adults to start at 64 ounces, and then we take into um, account what your exercise looks like. Are you a sweater? I have some people that come in here and tell me that they just look absolutely gorgeous and beautiful while they're exercising. If you saw me, I am red and I am, I mean, dripping with sweat. So I need a little bit more water and maybe an electrolyte. Um, but I, um, and then you would increase your water from there based off of that individual. Well, it's so interesting that you bring up the salt, the, because a lot of people, not a lot, I shouldn't say that, but um, coming into midlife, they all of a sudden have high blood pressure. Ah. 
Yeah. So that, that might be from sodium intake. You have to be careful with your sodium intake, correct? Yes. It could be two things. So blood pressure is, is one of those things that, you know, you have to dive a little bit deeper in, into, like, I know that there's definitely a genetic predisposition for sure. Right. Um, you can have like white coat syndrome, we call it. Like as soon as that person comes to measure your blood pressure, skyrocket. That's right? my husband. He has that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I feel so bad. I have clients that have it soon. I feel so bad. Um, you know, but dehydration, believe it or not, can can drive that blood pressure up too. So it's a fine balance of your water intake and your sodium intake. So a couple of things we'll do from a dietitian standpoint is if somebody has high blood pressure, we'll obviously ask about their genetic history just to get an idea of what that looks like. But we'll take a look at their total sodium in a day and their water, and we can give them pretty good um, insight into the changes that they need to integrate to help manage it. So eating a bag of chips probably isn't smart for somebody that has high blood pressure. It's it's going to have a lot of sodium in there. Yes. So it would be a good experiment to see, okay, what's my blood pressure now? And then what is it shortly after? <laughs> yeah, that is, that is really interesting. Okay. So when we're in midlife, mm -hmm. we have, you know, things are happening, changing with our bodies and we have these wonderful things called hot flashes. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything from a nutrition standpoint that we can do to help with those? You know, I, 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 I do as much research on these types of things as I can. I feel disappointed at times um, with the research um, for perimenopause and menopause um, because there's not a lot there from a nutrition perspective. Um, and, you know, obviously I... I could be looking at the wrong things. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the most research that I see from the hot flashes, believe it or not, and this is going to be a big bummer, it's like looking at your hydration. Um, and also that there are some foods that can kind of cause the hot flash. And I don't know, you know, I looked at this study, I didn't really think that it was um, that big of a population size, and I can't quote it right now, uh, but they said, you know, some of your hot and spicy foods or like coffee and things like that can kind of create hot flashes. I have some people in uh, my office who are like, I don't do any of that. There's no rhyme or reason with my hot flashes. I tend to kind of think that it's, pro it's, it's mostly related to that hormone surge and fall, um, but there's not really a... From a nutrition perspective, there's not anything that I feel completely comfortable with that I could say, okay, you need right. to do this and it will help you. I think we're just, we yeah. have to live with them. They stink. <laughs> well, speaking of hormones, uh -huh. I mean, that must really sort of be calculated into our weight gain. Absolutely. Yes. And I will tell you the surprising thing is the hormones aren't checked a lot. So and I can even talk about my own experience. I mean, I'm not embarrassed to share. I'm going to be 44 in August. I just keep getting older. I'm not sure what's happening um, because I feel the same as I did when I was 20 in my mind. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've even experienced, you know, talking to my physician um, and this isn't a knock to them, but hey, why don't we order some labs? Let's look at the hormones. I feel like I'm starting, you know, perimenopause. And I just think, it's not a routine thing that is done. And my speculation is it's because of, you know, managed care is kind of uh, dictates how um, some people work, but I've been very lucky in my practice that when I have a client that I really, really need the hormones to be checked, you know, we can, we can find a way to do that. I will say um, you got to advocate for yourself though. Um, and if you, if you don't feel comfortable advocating for yourself, you got to get somebody who's going to advocate for you. But yes, I believe hormones, very, very important um, in midlife. Yes. Well, they wreak havoc. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so if I wanted to go back to hot flashes, one thing okay. that I have found just on my own personal level, and this is not a mm -hmm. study, but alcohol oh. seems to affect my hot flashes. Yes. When yes. I'm not drinking, I'm like much better. Yes. But especially, well, I, we talked about this. I took a sensitivity test and uh -huh. I found out that, you know, I have mild 
um, allergies to gluten and dairy and yeast. Mm -hmm. And so I have found not drinking wine actually has helped me a lot. Do you have any thoughts on that? Alcohol is one of those um, uh, foods that, that I left out that can affect uh, hot flashes. You know, and it probably has something to do with the way that it's digested and absorbed. I mean, when you drink alcohol tw right away, 20% of that is absorbed in the stomach. Um, the other 80% kind of floats in through your intestine. Um, you can really only digest and absorb for women. It's a bummer, like one drink uh, uh, an hour. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but anything that's not absorbed is recirculated to the brain. So I, I tend to wonder, um, is part of that recirculation to the brain affecting, you know, the temperature gauge and hot flashes? It would be a pretty neat study uh, to look at. Also, you know, it's a diuretic, so it does cause you to, um, you know, urinate a little bit more and that dehydration could be what kind of increases that temperature and puts you right into a hot flash. Yeah, that's true. Now with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and with the flu coming, oh. uh, the flu season, you mm -hmm. know, we get that every fall. What can we do to boost our immune systems? That's a great question. Um, you know, really from a, an, uh, an immunosuppressant standpoint, Again, I know that I'm talking about this quite often, but your fruits and vegetables are the real hero here. I mean, we're looking, we want to look for, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E, um, your vitamin D. Um, so I would say uh, your vitamin C and E are found in a lot of your fruits and vegetables. Your vitamin D is in your dairy products. Um, so I think just making sure that you really are getting that whole food source. I think a lot of people tend to start supplementing you know, my rule of thumb with supplementation is if you don't need it, your body excretes it, right? So you're making your kidneys work a little bit harder than they need to, to kind of get rid of that particular product. So what I would recommend for people, and what I've told some of my friends is, okay, as soon as COVID started, because everybody was so fearful, you know, there's a couple of things that we should start doing right away. It's making sure that we're hydrated, right? We should make sure that we have at least five fruits and vegetables in a day. We want to have our lean protein. We want to make sure we have at least the two to three servings of dairy a day to make sure that we get that vitamin D in and calcium and get out and walk, start working your lungs. Um, I'm, you know, I would be interested to see what research is going to show us, but um, I just think that that's going to be really, really important for people as we move into this pretty scary season. Well, it's interesting because I, you know, my group has asked about supplements for, mm -hmm. for midlife. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you have any, are there any recommendations or just like you were saying, you know, the vitamin, uh, E, C, D. So, um, I, I, that's a big, big question that I get often as well. I think it's important to kind of search and see if there are any deficiencies. Um, but I mean, I think right off the cuff, we could say most people lose, um, muscle mass and then with the decrease in estrogen, um, our bone strength decreases. So looking at calcium and vitamin D would be something that you could do. Um, again, I'm a little bit picky and I prefer for people to get it from a food source, but you know, sometimes people don't. So maybe looking at a calcium and a vitamin D, maybe a multi, if um, we're working with like a picky eater or somebody who doesn't really like their veggies and, and has like texture issues. Well, you know, when you say fruits and vegetables, can you actually name the, the type that we should be eating? Because that can be, you know, I can have iceberg lettuce and I'm like, I ate my vegetable. Like, right, you know? right. Um, I don't really prefer one fruit or vegetable over another. I think it's important that when you, if you were being cognitive of what you eat to take a look at, believe it or not, this sounds really silly, the colors, right? Like we want a variety of colors. I agree. Iceberg lettuce has a little bit more water in it. Um, you well, know, hydration. <laughs> yep. So we've got some hydration. Um, but I think it's having a variety and being flexible with the fruits and vegetables. I will tell you there's a lot of misinformation out there. I got on Facebook the other day, which I hate to do, and the um, advertisement was telling me that bananas are going to cause an increase in belly fat. So I was like, first of all, Facebook, you're not, you don't understand who you're marketing to. Um, but, you know, let's not be fearful of fruits and vegetables. Let's oh, just have a variety. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and I've always heard green is good. You know. Green is good. Green is Green good. Is I love really red, good. um, orange. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> so talking about collagen and bone broth powders, mm -hmm. they seem to be kind of all the, the rage right now. Do right. they work and how do you choose one? So it depends on what we're talking about as far as do they work. Um, and that's a question, you know, I'm a pain in the neck. That's the question I give my clients when they're asking me to try something. I'm, I've always been confused with the bone broth. Like, like I said, I, I'm um, part of my descent is Italian. And I was thinking about this when the bone broth came out. I was like, isn't this what my grandmother made when she started her soup? And isn't this what I make when I'm starting my soup base? But anyways, that's neither <laughs> there nor, here nor there. Um, you know, there's lots of benefits to bone broth. Um, I think that it's very soothing to the stomach. Um, and it is something that we do recommend for, um, a lot of our DI patients, depending on, uh, what's going on from an inflammation standpoint. Um, do you need to buy the products that are on the market? No, if it's easier to do that, that's fine. But I think you can make bone broth just as um, easy as purchasing something. Collagen is, is all the rage now. Um, I, and there's research that shows that it helps with skin elasticity um, and those types of things. That's the, that's the only research that I found that really proves um, um, anything specific to that particular type of protein. A lot of people will add these products like collagen to like get to their total protein needs in a day. Um, and again, it's individualized. If, if I can have somebody get to their um, needs from Whole Foods, I know I'm pretty boring, keep saying the same thing. I'd prefer that. Um, I don't think either will hurt someone if they decide to take, you know, the collagen or the bone broth, but um, do I think it's going to change someone's life? From an evidence-based science, I'm not sure, but if they feel like it is and it's a placebo effect, I'm all for it. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> now, how about inflammation? We haven't really talked about inflammation. Uh-huh. How, uh, you know, it's funny because in New York, they have these, well, not now, they're, maybe they're opening up, but they literally have these freezers mm -hmm. where people go in and freeze themselves mm -hmm. and them out to hurt, sort of help with inflammation. Is there mm -hmm. something else we can do or avoid to help us with inflammation? <laughs> so I think inflammation is that another buzzword. Um, you know, there is definitely evidence that people do have inflammation um, and there are specific kind of uh, disease states that can cause inflammation. Um, if you do have an intolerance to a particular food, you can get immediate inflammation, an allergy, you can get inflammation. Um, you know, I think a lot of people come into our office and we see about 70 clients a week and I would say probably a third, uh, want to come in for an anti-inflammation diet. And, um, you know, I just, I like to stay away from those types of buzzwords and, and I know that's silly, but I think what happens is people read things like that or hear things like that and they kind of put themselves in this pocket that, you know, okay, my struggle is that I have inflammation, right? And, you know, my 100% focus needs to be to decrease this inflammation. I would say if you do have inflammation, there's definitely a route to take, but I would probably seek out like a, a, a uh, somebody who has experience with that to see if you want to move forward. So there's not a really a magic pill with inflammation. Um, and I actually hate to say it, but I think most people who start to talk to us about inflammation or ask us about it, don't even really know what they're talking, like what they mean with that question. Do you know what I mean? Like right. a lot of people will say, I have inflammation. Can you help me? And I'll say, well, what are your symptoms? And they're not really sure. Right. Well, how about probiotics? That's also all the rage. Uh-huh. I think the rage with the probiotics is coming down a little bit as they've done more research. Um, I've been, you know, again, probiotics are natural in most foods. So it's definitely something that we do focus on and we do prescribe for somebody who is showing us that they do have um, a change in their gut microbiome. Um, but the latest research, believe it or not, is, is saying, you know, really you should cycle the probiotics. So 30 days on, 30 days off, 30 days on, 30 days off. Um, we go back and forth. We talk about probiotics quite a bit here. Myself and Don, who is our GI guru, guru here, 
um, we've really kind of backed off on the probiotics a little bit more um, just because uh, more research is showing, you know, does it, do we really need to kind of throw all this stuff into the system unless we can see that there's marked changes to work with? So we don't really fly as blind with them anymore. Uh, we look for more like evidence to show that it would help. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's good to know. Well, this has been amazing. It's flown by. I can't yes. believe it. And so thank you for all of this wealth of information, Amy. Thank you for having me. I love how much you're interested in this. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Have a great day. You too.